Well, hello and welcome to this edition of the EV Revolution Show. My name is Kenneth Bocor. I'm your host, episode 18, here in uh, the early part of November that I'm recording this show. Wanted to keep on track with a little bit more shorter shows on a more frequent basis. So I've got a few things I want to talk about today, so I'm going to get right into it. One of the things uh, I wanted to bring up first was this article that I came across. It, now, it's specific to Ontario, where I live here, but I think it's a good representative of various other areas in the world, specifically those areas in the modernized countries, industrialized countries, and so forth, where where this is certainly a problem and uh, things are being tracked. So obviously, people like myself and other YouTubers and other people that are out there, educators and so forth, uh, government officials and down the line, do what we do to promote EV adoption because the ultimate goal is to lower greenhouse gas emissions in some form or fashion. Because we do know that the science is there proving that climate change is happening and the main catalyst for climate change is man and what we've done to the to the, our atmosphere over the last hundred or so years in the industrialized uh, revolution. Now there's this report that came out specifically to Ontario that talked about tracking Ontario greenhouse gas emissions and since 1990 uh, or starting in 1990 when, when we as a province were actually tracking these numbers with a bit more effort, um, Ontario emitted about 179 megatons of carbon dioxide. So remember that number uh, and other greenhouse gas uh, greenhouse gases. Now, emissions rose throughout the 90s and they peaked as high as 208 megatons in the year 2000. Um, now, since then, Ontario and a lot of other states, jurisdictions, and countries have done a lot to eliminate coal-fired coal power. Um, and, of course, the automotive industry as, and, and transport in general are looking to build and sell and market and operate more fuel-efficient vehicles across the board, so including trucks and things like that. So all that has contributed in Ontario to a lowering, actually, of the greenhouse gas emissions to 161 megatons by 2016, so just a couple of years ago. So again, we went from 179 up to 208 and back down to 161. Um, again, at that time, three-quarters of our climate-changing gas emissions, greenhouse gas emissions were produced by burning fossil fuels. And that's an interesting perspective. Three-quarters of what goes into the atmosphere here in Ontario were, 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 for greenhouse gas emissions, um, the root cause for those emissions were attributed to burning fossil fuels. That's, that's not just cars, that's burning fossil fuels in general. So in other words, emissions came from people driving cars, though, and trucks and heating buildings. Those are the kind of the two main culprits. Of course, if we have um, other factories that burn gases and things like that, that certainly contributes to that. But out of those numbers, transportation is about 35 percent of that and buildings and, and, so, uh, and, and out of the, uh, the emissions that came from cars and buildings, 35 percent was from transportation um, and 21% from buildings representing most of these numbers. So where, where I'm trying to go with that is that the transportation sector attributed to a growth actually in emissions of 34% since 1990. Well, what does that mean? It means we have more cars on the road. It's a simple fact. Most countries are growing countries. Populations are booming and continue to grow. And with that brings more industry and more cars and trucks and vehicles on the road. Uh, and that includes, you know, uh, trains and, and, and transport trucks and all that kind of stuff as well. But I think the key fact uh, that a lot of people miss and get swept under the rug is that um, consumer road passenger vehicles make up the vast majority of greenhouse gas emissions within the transportation sector. And the transportation sector is one of the largest sectors that contribute to greenhouse gas emissions in the world. So remember those two things. I think those are, are pretty important. Um, you know, only a smaller number came from the industry, about 30% in Ontario. And our electricity generation, as I mentioned here on previous shows, is pretty clean. We only get about 3% or even less now, this is a couple of years old, of uh, greenhouse gas emissions attributed to the generation of electricity. And I know once in a while I get a comment or I talk to somebody that says, hey, generating electricity is just as dirty as buying an electric car, so it's not it's a moot point. Well, that's not true. You have to look at the areas that you live in. Now, maybe in other states or countries, 
um, or jurisdictions, they'll be more coal centric or more various other means that emit more greenhouse gas emissions in the uh, generation of the electricity. So you do have to look at it regional where you about so you are, but certainly here in Ontario and a lot of other countries that are even better than us, um, you know, we're only contributing about 3% of our greenhouse gas emissions from the generation of electricity for the power. So when you look at all that, um, I just wanted to kind of start the show with this topic because I think it's relevant. I think that when you, when you take this kind of viewpoint and you look at it, it, you know, blow it up in a global perspective, I think it hits home for many, many of us. And as I said at the top, that's where I do. And that's where many of us people that are involved in promoting EV adoption and, and whatever environmental cause that you're, you're part of or cause is, um, I mean, there's health risks and, and benefits that could be attributed to lowering GHGs and all kinds of other topics that we could spin into, which I won't on the show, trying to keep it shorter. But the simple fact is that the adoption of EVs can significantly reduce greenhouse gas emissions. There is that connection, even with power being generated, even with more cars uh, zapping the grid, you know, taking power. And there are other issues with grids that we could talk about another time. But that simple fact that uh, EVs subs can substantially uh, lower greenhouse gas emissions be uh, through the transportation sector is something that I wanted to start to show off. Because why Why is, is all this relevant? Well, I've talked about on uh, for the last couple of years now, this, this hockey stick approach that we're seeing in EV adoption. Uh, and, you know, I put up slides almost every show, or every couple of shows that shows that similar curve. And, and that's great. Um, we've just hint at the end of September, uh, it was the biggest selling plug in uh, plug in vehicle sales month in history since they since this has been tracked and since they've been building them, really. So as of September 18th, uh, over 200,000 plug-in electric vehicles were sold in that month. And that's a global number. That's a worldwide number. And that's a plug-in vehicle. So remember, anything that has a plug, it doesn't necessarily have to be a full electric battery only. It can be a plug-in hybrid. But the significance is a vehicle with a plug. So uh, uh, websites like Inside EVs and others track these things really, really well. And they're getting much better, or they're much more detailed on the data. But um, this article pointed out that that is a significant number that we've that we've seen globally of 200,000 uh, over 200,000 plug-in vehicles sold globally. That's actually a 61% growth rate from last year. So to go from here, 61%, that's a pretty steep curve. So we're well into that upward swing of this technology revolution here in the EV revolution that we're seeing. So what this means relatively though, is that the the number for year to date totals worldwide, and again, I try to focus on global numbers. I know Inside EVs and other publications focus on the US. Um, they have a plug-in report every day, every month and, and numbers that are US focused, but that's not a true representation of the rest of the world, folks. Company, uh, countries like China are out uh, are out selling and out delivering the U.S. by by a large factor of vehicles. So the 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 bulk of the EV deliveries and sales is not U.S. centric, and that's one re you know one reason I always try to look at a global perspective because climate change is a global problem. It's not just cutting down Canada's emissions or U.S. emissions or Mexico's emissions or whatever. It we all have to have to do our parts, and and, and it has to be done at a global scale for it to work. So the the cumulative number of of uh, plug-in vehicles that have been sold so far after the end of December worldwide is almost 1.3 million. Huge number, 1.3 million plug-in EVs. That's a combi again a combination of with a plug and with a battery. Now that's up 68% um, year over year. So again, we're really seeing that swing. But you know, even with those fantastic numbers, 1.3 million cars year to date so far um, that were plug-in that's only 1.8% of the market share. It's a very, very low number of the entire global new car sales, I say new automobile sales, because that includes pickup trucks and SUVs, but consumer uh, automobile transportations, only 1.8% folks. So we have a long way to go. And yes, the Model 3 is setting records for sales. And, and you know I've already talked about my opinions on that. So that's all good. Um, and we know, you know, and I know that the Model 3 was the top, has been the top selling car so far this year. It's, again, it's no surprise they got to fill those orders over, uh, over 80, almost 83,000 Model 3 deliveries now. That's great. Hey, they got to 
300,000 or more to go still. So keep going with that, plus some new sales. So, it, you know, it's all good. I won't get in, into all the specifics as far as manufacturers. I mean, you know, it's good, but there, there's many manufacturers contributing to this growth, not just Tesla, BYD and uh, BAIC in China, BMW, Renault, Nissan, Chevrolet, Volkswagen, Toyota. You know, the list goes on and on. There's a lot of, uh, of or uh, automobile manufacturers that are building some sort of plug-in vehicle, whether it be a plug-in hybrid or not. So all good folks. I think it's something to, to, um, to applaud from that perspective. And, um, you know, I just wanted to relate that to the scale of where we need to get to. So, you know, off the top, giving you some visibility into the greenhouse gas uh concern and, and how transportation specifically the consumer can affect that and where we are in the United States I received information that uh, as of September the United States has has hit 1 million electric cars sold in America since the inception of, of electric cars 1 million so again the number I told you earlier 1.3 that's a global number and that's just year to date but Typically, global sales for EVs have been anywhere from a million and a half to two million over the last few years. So you can do the math. So even since 2010, maybe I don't have a total number for global sales since uh, the inception, but I'm going to estimate six to eight million is probably fair. So out of that, one million is, is in the U.S., even if we say five million. One million, uh, they just hit the one millionth sale of an EV in the U.S. in September. That's a fantastic feet when you think only you know when the roadster started coming out and and i think it was 20 uh 2010 2011 or 09 in very limited quantities i mean you can count the ev1 into that but they were all taken back so i don't know about that uh but certainly nissan started selling the leaf in 2011 from a u.s perspective and so on and so on so it's nice to see that that they've hit 1 million cars but there's a lot of room to go um, I, I forget what the number is for cars just sold in the U.S. alone on a yearly basis. Um, so obviously we have a long way to go from adoption and there's a lot of, lot of potential for increasing everybody, all the manufacturers. And that's why all the manufacturers are starting to get into electrification. And most of them are several years behind. Uh, probably Nissan's the closest since they started the LEAF really early in 2010 as a global car. But it's good to see that, and, and I'm going to come back to some of these points at the end when, we, when I talk about some comments and some questions that I've received uh, from the last show and to bring this into uh, relative perspective. Now, on the automotive front, I just do want to recognize that in the last um, conference call, I didn't say the fact that Tesla had also announced some that the Model Y prototype was approved for production. Again, we don't really have any pictures. There are lots of renderings and what people think this thing's going to look like. Um, but Elon did confirm that the um, it is going to be produced, probably going to be revealed next March. They seem to like to do these big reveals in March time frame, uh, at the end of March or for April Fool's kind of thing. Uh, so that seems to be the speculated, again, time frame. This is all speculation, folks, right now. Um, the Model Y, if you're not familiar with what that's supposed to be from Tesla, it's going to be a crossover kind of vehicle. So a little bit, you know, I think it's based on the Model 3 platform, but it's going to be smaller than, a, than an X, obviously. And uh, we do expect it to, to start hitting production in 2020, according to Tesla. That's what they're saying. Price point now, uh, it's going to have to be a little higher than the 3, but certainly not as high as the S and the estimated speculation right now for pricing on this on the model y is around the forty five thousand dollar us range to start no other uh specs at all on this other than i think i certainly agree with a lot of the speculation out there that i don't think they're going to have falcon wing doors on this i think they're going to do away and go back to normal doors on this car it's just too crazy expensive and it's a lot of engineering and it's cool but uh, it doesn't work for a lot of people and uh, it's an expensive thing to do. So if you're trying to get the price down, uh, doing those kinds of features and engineering on a less costly car is going to be a challenge. So that's what the rumor bill is kind of talking about right now. But the good thing is that Elon did confirm that they've got a prototype that they want to start going into production with. So, you know, as I always say, whatever Elon says from his time 
you know, add, add more time to it. It's just the way it is. There are things beyond his control, beyond any company's control that, that are at the scale that Tesla is and the other auto manufacturers. It's not hard to turn on a dime for those guys. So they really need to take a long time and plan and get a lot of pieces in place before they can start moving cars off an assembly line. So my hat's off to them, and we'll uh, and I'll certainly keep tracking any info I can on the Model Y, and I'm sure that uh, next spring we'll get a nice treat when we get the reveal on the Model Y, and we'll be able to get more information to share. And the last thing I have to share from an automotive perspective on the show today is uh, BMW with their iX3 all electric iX3 that they're coming out with. There were some spy shots that I have up on the screen here that were taken recently about that car. Now, when I look at it compared to normal uh, X3, I don't see much difference, to be honest with you. Um, they talked about some really small um, external elements that they're, sh that they're seeing, but I think the point of this story and these spy shots is that BMW is getting closer when they start doing some road testing and all that kind of stuff. When you see the cars in camo, camo paint and, and wraps and all that stuff, it means that they're, they're getting close to doing some stuff. They're shaking stuff out. Um, if you're not familiar with the iX3 concept, it was showcased in Be Beijing last year, I believe. It's estimated to have a battery pack of about 70 kilowatt hours, uh, which should give you about 400 kilometers or 300, sorry, 249 miles, but that's on the WLTP cycle. So, you know, take off 20 or 30 percent on that number for EPA is, is a fair estimate, I would believe, let's say 20 percent. So, so 249 miles, you know, another, so just a 200 mile, that could be disappointing if it's just that. That's my take on it. Um, I don't, you know, it's not, the, the X3 isn't a big SUV. It's going to go up with probably the Kia Nero, Nero EV from a size perspective. I think it's a little bigger than the Kona EV, but I could be wrong if there's anybody out there that wants to drop a comment or send me an email about those comparisons. I'd love to hear it, but just visually looking at those cars, um, the Kona may be a tad smaller than the X3, and the X3 may be a tad around the the Kia EV, Nero EV size, uh, but it's certainly not a, a huge SUV. But so to have that kind of juice, if you know, if your competitors are going to have 300 miles, which we're seeing on the Kona and the Hyundai right now from reports of people testing this stuff, Bjorn and everybody else that's out there with these cars in Europe, and some of the California press stuff that they've done, um, I, you know, I. BMW is going to have to step it up a bit on this because it's going to be really tough to, to for a price tag perspective. And I'm, I don't think this is going to be cheap. There's no pricing, but let's say it's going to start at maybe the $45,000 US range and go up from there. I, I don't know what an X3 costs today from a nice perspective, but I would guess that the uh, it's going to cost somewhere around that. And to just have 200 miles might not be attractive enough. So I think BMW, if anybody's listening to this, I hope that those numbers are a little low and that um, because they're, they're WLTP and they're always really high on those. Uh, it's not a very good cycle to, uh, to determine range. Um, you know, good thing it's a zero emission. It should have an out rate of about 270 horsepower, 200 kilowatts, and have some sort of fast charging capabilities. Um, I only, I fully expect this to have 100 kilowatt charging as a minimum. And that seems to be the bar nowadays that everybody's coming out with. And uh, it's going to be produced in China originally and then exported uh, worldwide from that perspective. Uh, we don't have a date for the U.S. and North America and other parts of the world yet, but the expectation is that it should arrive in 2020, which is only about a year and a nudge more. So have a look if you anybody finds out any more information on this. I would love to hear from you. All right, one last story for today before I get into the mailbag. Yes, I have some mailbag today. Is I, I was at an event uh, last week in Guelph, Ontario. It was called the Emerge EV Show. I've got a, did a little couple minute video about that. Uh, here it is. Check it out and hope you like it. All right, folks. Well, I'm here in downtown Guelph in a little bit of a snowy Saturday, kind of a wet, wet snow we're getting early this month. And I'm here with Evan Ferrari, and they've named the car after you. Thank they, you. They did name the car after I saw, me. They I, really he did. He told me that, so you know, I'm <laughs> believing. And well, th pleasure to meet you. Pleasure to meet and you too. Listen, thank you for inviting me out to this great event and uh, in this beautiful location, uh, which is fantastic. And, and I wanted to get the folks. Uh, some information about what uh, eMERGE does and what are you guys are all about? Uh, simply put, uh, what eMERGE does is we fight climate change okay. uh, every day. Our mandate wow. is to help people save money by reducing their impact on the environment. 
And as your viewers will know, switching to an EV helps people save money and has a profoundly positive impact on the environment at the same time. We do a lot of work on the residential side as well, helping people reduce energy consumption and water consumption. But as we know, with EVs, every gas or ice car we take off the road, there's four tons of CO2 emissions. About a quarter of the entire um, uh, carbon uh, uh, output of a, of a household in a given year. Wow. It's, pretty, it's pretty incredible. Yeah, when you, when you start hearing that kind of science and the facts behind it, it, it really does stop and make you think. Now, this is your second year doing this event, it is. is that correct? It yeah. is, okay. yeah. Uh, and last year, you know, it was one of those things where we understood the math on, on EVs and we said we should do a car show. We've never done one before. Um, we had 5,000 people show up. So last night we had over 2,000. Uh, we had it people. Crowd. We, uh, it was it was a good crowd, and we're, we're expecting a good 3,000 today. Um, awesome. And uh, I'm hoping that the bad weather helps us. Mm -hmm. Now, having said that, we'll also have EV owners outside with their their cars uh, chatting people up. As as your viewers know, that EV owners are the best are mm -hmm. evangelical uh, about EVs once once they have one. And we've got plug and drive here with uh, three cars. We have a, a Bolt, a Volt, and a Ford Fusion as well. Oh, good. So besides that, we've also got got uh, uh, an e-bike, a, a local bike shop that will be doing test drives on bikes and e-scooters of all things. Now is the municipality behind you guys as far as trying to spur EV adoption and the awareness from a climate change and energy yeah. you know, consumption great, perspective? A great question. What we've spent is, gee, I'm going to point yeah. at my shirt here, the 100% renewable project. What we did was we convinced the city to support a goal of 100% renewable by 2050. And it was a unanimous support of council back in uh, May of this year, this, this, this last spring. Um, the, um, and and uh, from our perspective, we know that switching uh, to EVs is critical to it. We have to, we have to electrify our complete transportation system, so it's a piece of the puzzle. Um, and the city is, is, is now in the early stages of working to electrify its fleet as well, as most muni municipalities yes. are. But our intention is to continue to push, it, push them along and how, how can we help make that happen sooner. Excellent. I mean, that's a big part of the electrification as landscape, as you say, is, is municipalities and governments and, and even commercial entities electrifying fleets, taxis. In the UK, mm -hmm. it's becoming a big, big push now of taxis getting electrified, especially if you want to go into downtown London and these congestion areas right. and stuff like that. Right. There, a lot of cities in Spain are now yep. converting to actually car-free zones and that kind of stuff. It's all great to see. I'd like to thank Evan and his staff for organizing and running a really nice event. All the people that I spoke to were very much interested in learning more about EVs and that's the kind of audience you want to reach. I'm glad my leaf got the thumbs up. Thanks again Evan, we'll see you next year. And again my thanks to Evan and his team at the eMERGE guys for running a great show. It was certainly unique and from that perspective. It didn't show in the video as far as the crowds because I was actually videoing just before we opened. So uh, most of what I got there, since it was quieter, but um, during the Saturday afternoon, it got real busy. There was a lot of people around. So it was nice to be able to talk to a lot of people, ask questions. And I can confirm folks that the majority of people that came up to me were people that were thinking about an electric car of some sort, uh, considering it. And um, that's kind of, you know, the whole purpose of doing these events and these shows. It's not so that all, all of us or a lot of people that are watching me, we all love EVs and we want to continue to embrace that and, and share information and knowledge and enjoy that. But it's also to get people to share that knowledge with people that don't have EVs today or that, you know, are, are not thinking. Maybe we can get people starting to think about it. And I, you know, over time, that's kind of what I do here with my shows and public outreach and, and uh, the podcasts and everything is just to try to get some knowledge out there to help people make informed decisions. It's not going to be for everybody at this time, but slowly over time, I think that we can get there. Now, um, while that again, why that's why that's important, I wanted to just leverage quickly. So the, all the numbers that I talked about in the past um, are are very very important as far as you know lowering the greenhouse gas uh, emissions. And there were there was a couple comments up from my last show on YouTube. Um, if you look at some of the comments, and people were, were talking about mass market and that it's really more about about a better quality than price and so forth and. And you know I can I can get it, and I appreciate the feedback and the analogies and the examples that people were sending me. But let me just put this out there. I, I don't have off the top of my head what the global number of car sales is. As I mentioned earlier, 
it could be 40 million it could be more it's certainly a large number and when when evs are only at 1.8 percent or or not even you know just under two percent of those currently all these numbers we're hearing about tesla kicking out 50 60 thousand model threes and you know leafs and and chevy now ramping up more and all these numbers are great but they're so little yet we're starting to chip away but if the if the automobile market is so huge from a global perspective now factoring in some countries that maybe don't have ev infrastructure that that aren't there yet like maybe india and some others that do buy a lot of cars but that maybe aren't there from a infrastructure and supportability perspective uh, but certainly china is so and china's continuing to grow like crazy so when you when, even if you you shrink that that overall global number down a bit of, of countries that actually can get into electrification and that have supportability for it it's still a big number of vehicles. So we are quite a long way away from making a difference. So the convert, the point I'm trying to make here, folks, is that when I talk to people about more of a mass market car, to me, affordability is a big part of that. When you're still in the, in the $35,000 and up range of a car, that's not affordable for a, a good percentage of people that could buy a car. And so they buy a used car or they buy a cheaper car if, if it's looking at new perspective. And I get it. Uh, you know, I've owned lots of new used cars and I still do. But in order to make a bigger impact, we need to get more cars on the road. Not necessarily cars with more range that are more expensive, that are better quality. But we need to get cars that are decent quality, that have a, 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 enough range to make that purchase uh, warranted and Again, a purchase price that makes it attractive for a consumer to get into because we know the benefits of, of cheaper fueling costs from your electricity in most areas, the benefits of lower maintenance and so on, the drivability and all that good stuff that we talk about all the time. So in order to get more cars in the people's hands, you can't just make them better and charge more. It doesn't work that way. That's not going to, in my opinion, really accelerate the growth that we need to see happen. And that's my point is, for, for, for us to make climate change, to affect climate change radically in a, in a short period of time, we need to see radical growth in this industry. So not just a hockey stick, but we need, to, we, we need it to blast off and take off through the roof here, basically. Because we need to get big, big numbers of um, greenhouse gas emitting vehicles off the road, and we need to get them replaced or augmented with plug-in vehicles of some sort. And again, I still recognize the need for plug-in hybrids. They serve a purpose and they do a pretty good job in most cases. So I get it. We need more product. We need more stuff, as I've been saying, on the battery electric side. So um, hopefully that's making some sense. And that's kind of where I go with when I'm talking about that messaging and when I'm talking to people as well, is that we can't, this isn't a waiting game. We can't sit here for the next 20 years and slowly ramp up this industry. It has to take off because climate is the climate change aspect of what's going on is not slowing down. Most countries are not hitting the Paris Accords and other targets that they've put that they've put to them. Canada being a culprit here, we're way behind. Now we may catch up, but there's been so much lag since all this talk. There's not been a lot of action, and there's a lot of policies and, and governments that are actually turning things backwards that are stalling well let's look at this let's look at how this affects climate change let's reverse this bill let's add this bill let's do this and that's just slowing things down so my perspective on this is that we we have to do it the other way we need to speed up this industry and one of the main recogn reasons to do, uh, main excuse me ways to do that you can tell I'm passionate about this folks I'm losing my words is to get the cars cheaper so that we can get more people buying them. That it's not rocket science. It's if you give somebody a 200 mile or a 250 mile range or the sweet spot of a 300 mile range, my goodness. But I think, you know, the least doing well at 150 miles. So if you give them a 200 mile range with an overnight charging time and, you know, an hour of DC fast charging with some thermal management and it's a decent package and that's at 25,000, we're going to get cars out the door. We're going to get people going, well, why would I buy a ICE Honda Civic or an ICE Kia Forte or whatever, a Chevy, you know, a Cruze or whatever, you know, are selling at that class point. 
uh, at that price point because you know those are the types of cars that are selling at those you know focuses and fiestas and all that kind of stuff that's out there versus and so forth we need to get to that level not the premium level and that's where manufacturers are starting with suvs because it's a money thing and we've talked about that so i won't go into that but hopefully i'm going to wrap this this part of it up hopefully that makes sense and that's why when I'm always talking about getting that price point and I'm beating up on manufacturers, then Tesla is included. Now, Tesla is a premium brand manufacturer. They will not, in my, I don't see in my lifetime them getting to a $25,000 price ever because that's not the business they're in. They're in selling premium cars. 35 is as low as they'll ever go. And if you can get that unicorn when it comes out, all the power to you. I, I hope so. But I don't, that, that isn't even out, that uh, Model 3 price point. And the Y is going to be higher and whatever else they come up with higher. I can't see them going lower than that. And nor should they if they're a premium car vendor. BMW doesn't build brand new cars and, sh and slop them out at twenty five grand. It doesn't happen. So we need the rest of the automotive industry with their lines that they have, Chevy and Ford and, and GM and everybody else, to come into that you know class point with an electric car but they're a few years away. And so the urgency is that they really have to start pouring money, R&D and development into this. And hopefully we can have batteries and we can have enough raw materials to get the batteries, to get the into these cars that we need to sell faster. Because I know that potentially battery shortages and lack of materials is an issue in some areas. And I get it. And that's certainly holding things back. So hopefully you can see some of the logic there. Go on the web, look at greenhouse gas growth, emissions growth, and look at the transportation sector. And there, there's such a strong correlation that if we can really, you know, triple, quadruple, uh, multiply by a factor of 10 our efforts in EV adoption, that's one of the few ways that we're really going to see significant change in a short period of time because we don't have a lot of time. Weather's getting worse. All the stuff is getting worse. So we need to act and we need to act smartly on it so i'm going to finish up with a mailbag segment yay do my little mailbag shuffle dance there finally got some mail that uh, i could put on the show and i appreciate this now this is from tim uh tim's in chesterland ohio well uh, thanks a lot tim for sending me this email um, he was asking about winterizing uh, the evs or the benefits of evs in, in driving in the winter um, we had a quick conversation, I believe, about uh, tra about tires uh, offline. But you know, more accurate, Tim says that uh, you know EVs give you very responsive traction control. The weight of the batteries in that lower center of gravity adds a lot of, of of benefit to winter driving to slippery conditions. The instant on heat, my goodness, I can't tell you enough about that instant on heat. It's working really well at these colder temperatures. You know the. Uh, uh, even seated heats and, and all that kind of stuff. And the preconditioning is another thing that you can do. So um, I, won't, I won't get a lot into the winter stuff because, folks, I just did an audio podcast. And if you listen to my last audio podcast, you'll get about an hour's worth of information about winter, uh, you know, preparing your EV for the winter and tips and tricks as far as winter driving goes. Now, I am going to do a little bit of a segment on tires coming up in, in, in a couple of weeks. I'm actually going to get new tires, new snow tires and rims put on my Nissan Leaf. So I'm going to get a little bit of video of that, just a short clip and get a little bit of an interview with, with somebody about tires and why that they're so important and what, what the differences are from an EV perspective. So that'll be coming up in, in a couple of weeks uh, after I get mine done. But um, so I won't go into a lot of what Tim mentions as far as prepping the car and some of the tips and, and, uh, uh, and tricks. But he did actually send me something which I found kind of amusing and I'm running this video now. Hopefully you see that. So he's made a video of snow plowing his leaf and he said, you know, feel free to share it. Um, he ended up buying one of these one of these strap on snow plows that that worked for him. And you can see his leaf doing a really grand job of cleaning his very long driveway because it looks like Tim lives out there in the woods a bit. Um, so he's got a pretty good property that he needs to get access out of uh, in the winter time. So he's uh, had, you can see his leaf is an older one. He's, he's had it for a few years and, um, um, you know, he, he says it, it does great in the winter. So I, I wanted to thank Tim very much for sharing the video and for sharing his thoughts on uh, and his experience on the winter driving so far and the winter uh, benefits of EV driving in the winter. I appreciate that. Thank you very much, Tim. Please keep sending me uh, emails and comments, of course, on this. And uh, hey, if anybody want to try snow shoveling with their leaf, uh, send me a video this winter. I'd love to hear from you. 
Well, that's it for this edition of the show. It was a bit more of a higher level talk about greenhouse gas and, and transportation, all that stuff. And I, I purposely did that. Didn't want to get into a lot of details on this show from about manufacturers and stuff. So the story was a little bit similar in this one. Hope you enjoyed that. I just wanted to give that perspective because I, I think people, you know, I go on the forums and I read my, my, my YouTube comments and I look at other shows and I talk to other people and you know, we all get passionate about this model and that model of selling more and this is crap and that's very good and so forth. And, you know, it's nice to debate those things and it's nice to have opinions. But let's step back and look at the big picture here of why why it's so important to really help spur EV adoption. And it's not one model versus another because nobody, no singular company can do this. Elon has the dream of changing the world and he's done it, right? He's done it with with the Tesla and get in your know, lighting, sparking this whole industry that he's that he's been able to do. I'd love to hear your comments, of course. And if you want something to send me a video or an audio, uh, either a question or, or something unique, if you're plowing snow or doing something with your EV, I'd love to love to see that. You can email me at evrevolutionshow at gmail.com. That would be great to see. Uh, I do. I am on Twitter if you're not aware of that. So you can follow me on Twitter at evrevshow is my handle there. Don't forget, please, to subscribe on YouTube. Click that bell if you haven't already. You'll get notified of, of future shows. And as I mentioned earlier, I do the audio podcast. I try to keep them different and unique with some, some guests on, on different topics. You can find those on iTunes, on Google Play. You can find those on TuneIn Radio and Spotify now, if I'm not mistaken. So please check those out. EV Revolution Audio Podcast is a search that you would look for. It should come up. And finally, as always, my heartfelt thanks to all the Patreon supporters that I have. I do continue to get a few here and there more added on. I appreciate that. If you're interested in helping me to continue with what I do here, um, I'd love for you to check out my Patreon page at www.patreon.com forward slash EV Revolution Show. And uh, you can see what, you know, even a dollar a month, uh, that's the minimum, uh, would be great help if you feel like doing that. Less than, less than a coffee a week. Is that correct? Yeah, if it's Starbucks, for sure, <laughs> about that. So uh, maybe a Starbucks might be a little less, but anyway, do the math. So I appreciate that. Thank you very much for tuning in. I, I'm sure I'm going to get a lot of feedback on this show, and I welcome it wholeheartedly. So until next time, all the best, stay safe, and we'll see you later. Bye.